I still have no idea how I'm supposed to start these videos. Whatever. Hello, all you crazy people out there. My name is Michael, and I'm still talking about Game Maker Future Things with uh, Stephen Loney and the uh, the legendary Xor. Hello. Hey, how's it going, guys? All right, we're already off to a better start than last time. So there's uh, there's even more Game Maker update news things that we didn't have time to to go over last time, and uh, we're gonna try and hit them all today. We're also going to try and do this a little bit quicker because uh, some of us have to go in about an hour or so. Do you want to jump right into it? Do you want to start with uh, the object-oriented runtime? Uh, we're going to mention quickly the platform support. About oh, right. What's going away. <laughs> You've already jumped That was over. my idea, and it's already like blown past <laughs> my brain. <laughs> well, that's OK. So 32-bit, this is a long time in coming. The 32-bit support uh, runtime is being re removed. Um, so all it's going to be left is the 64 bit, which is really, if you have any system that's from the last 10 years, you should be already on 64 bit. So there should be a very small group of people that won't be supported on 32 bit. Um, and it's probably time to upgrade anyway. Uh, the, with one exception being for Android, they are still keeping the, um, uh, the 32 bit for, oh, I forget what it's called right now, but one of the exports for Android. So that's being kept, but it left me, but yeah, so largely that's one major thing coming. So anyone on older systems. Um, from like 2008 on 32-bit Windows, you're not going to be supported. Uh, probably, if this is going to be a problem for anyone, it's probably not going to be because their computer isn't 64-bit. It's probably going to be because they're using an extension or a DLL or something that was compiled as 32-bit and uh, maybe for one reason or another hasn't been updated in a really long time. Right, right. That's actually a very valid concern. So yeah, right. If you're, yeah, I, I didn't even think about that really. So uh, maybe if someone's, like we talked about last week, the old user-created uh, OpenAL or FMOD extensions, if someone's using those which haven't been updated since like ages ago, uh, that might be a problem. Right. But I don't think there are many users of those anymore. And in particular, uh, GameMaker is going to be getting FMOD support in some capacity anyway. That's probably not a, uh, a really going to be a really big disaster for any, anyone's game. Onto the future, right? Yeah, this is a change that probably should have been done quite a while ago. Yeah. Also, by the way, a lot of the uh, the subjects that we're going to be talking about here are the more like advanced programming nerd things, uh, whereas a lot of the the things that we hit last time were more like um, like IDE stuff and the way that the way that the engine works. Um, most of the subjects in this in this half are going to be things like uh, code theory and computer science theory and that kind of thing. Get to fall asleep too, so if you like that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, this doubles as a cure for insomnia. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, so there's object oriented stuff coming. Sorry, I'm trying to wrap my head around this now. So, what does this mean? So, like, so up until this point, um, Game Maker, so with the new runtime. Do you want an example or do you, do you have an idea of where to take this? Um, well, I'm thinking, so, so up until this point, the Game Maker runtime, I believe, has been functional. Yeah, how how what what would be a good example of this? So the uh, the common example that I've seen um, thrown around pretty often is that right now Game Maker is very like you would consider it an imperative style programming language. So you have functions that do things in order, uh, even if Game Maker has recently in the last two years added a lot of um, things that you can do with structs and methods. So most of the things that you would use Game Maker for are going to look like draw sprite, and then it would take the sprite as an, as an argument. Um, or maybe uh, instance create, and it would take, maybe that's not a good example, uh, it would take the, the object type as an argument. Whereas in the future, it would seem that instead of saying draw sprite, game maker is going to uh, have the sprite itself be an object instead of just an asset index, and then it would have a draw method. Right. And the same for like the object types would have like a, I don't know, a create or a spawn or a something method. Uh, the same way that a struct or a, uh, a game maker instance now would. Yeah, I'm I'm a bit conflicted about this because like I'm kind of a big fan of like functional programming, which that's probably not the majority, um, but I, I do see that the future. I mean, the most popular languages are object oriented, like C sharp and stuff. Is that's kind of the way things are going. Um, a part of me feels like the the functional programming side of things, how it has been, has actually this is very subjective is actually is actually easier to understand initially um i could be totally wrong on that but uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit i'm hoping they do this transition right um 
they have talked about adding a lot of compatibility stuff to onboard um, either projects that you might update or new users. That's one of the things I'm curious about is like how the compatibility process will work. I know that they did a pretty good job when they're going from one to two and, and all the GML changes and stuff there. But I have a feeling it's going to be pretty complicated switching like all of the functions around and everything's going to have a new name and new structure. Mm-hmm. Hopefully so, there's not too many issues there. Say for the 3D stuff, most of the compat- compatibility scripts going from uh, Studio 1 to 2 were just renaming things. Um, but this will probably involve having to like rearrange the order in which code is like written. Also, just to head off some small nitpicks, uh, functional programming is something else. That is when you think code is great, but I wish it looked more like my math homework. But imperative style uh, programming is is when you just have like a list of statements, like draw this, set color, whatever. Oh, okay. Functional pro- programmers are weird. <laughs> what about what about quickly here? Namespaces. Um, are you guys looking forward to namespaces? Yes. Yeah. What does that mean exactly? Can you elaborate for people that are not as familiar with that? Yeah, so um, I recently had another game maker uh, developer say, can you please update your tool so it stops breaking my tool? (laughs) Because we had a conflict in the namespace because I was using um, certain variable names and function names in my tool that was conflicting with their tool. We're we're stepping on each other's toes because of just the same names. So namespaces allows you to place variable names and things inside a nice nicely packaged zone of the program that's safe away from the other variable names um and you only use them when you like request them uh it it would be like so that you don't have to have like you don't have to prefix your functions and variable names with like these long um custom um values whatever yeah that's cool because like anybody that has made an asset that is uh, very module uh, based where you can add it to basically any type of game. If you make an asset like that, you need to think a lot about the variable names, especially if you're doing like global variables or even function names and stuff like that. Yeah. So it'll be cool to have a way to do that that's standardized that you know any asset that you make or you know any anything that you use across multiple projects, you don't have to worry about any conflicts. Yeah, and it seems the more and the more the community grows with tools and assets, the bigger the issue it becomes. Mm-hmm. Right now, pretty much everything in Game Maker, like every resource at least in Game Maker, is a global type. So if one person has a writes a library and has a function called I don't know, pet the dog or whatever, and someone else writes a library and they also have a function called pet the dog, suddenly you have a name in conflict. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. Oftentimes, like people will make different variants of a of a drawing um, script, for example, or a, a drawing function. So you might have like a draw a round rectangle or something. You create your own uh, script for that. But if it's something that's fairly common that other people have done as well, then you're gonna have a conflict. Mm-hmm. Especially if if someone has like a macro that's like you don't see this quite as much anymore now that Game Maker has uh, structs, but like vector x vector y whatever um and it's really only for use internally in that uh in that library or uh, example or whatever and it's not even supposed to be like revealed to the user and someone else has another project and they do the exact same thing that's another easy way that uh a lot of people have gotten naming conflicts between if they're trying to use code from multiple sources yeah this is why you see a lot of things like people uh like prefixing variable names and stuff and internal stuff with like three underscores uh, yeah. in the hopes that that will reduce the amount of traffic uh, w- uh, among functions with the same name. Apparently two underscores was not enough. Uh, when, when the last time 1.4 went to 2.0, I had a library that like conflicted with their compatibility scripts because I only used two and I should have used three. Perfect. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, name, that's Keep this. this yeah. If anyone's Four, used other five. programming langu- languages but is not familiar with the word namespaces, uh, different languages call them different things. In some languages, they're like packages or modules or something like that. It's all the same concept. All right. So who knows what this uh, native executables using LLVM is about? You do, right? I don't. I haven't <laughs> looked into it, to be honest. So can anyone explain? 
Okay, no. so right now, uh, most of you probably know Game Maker games are either built the uh, the normal way using the Game Maker Virtual Machine, which converts your GML into not machine code, but like a specialized um, set of instructions that is executed by the runner. Or if you're uh, if you're hardcore, you might use the YoYo compiler, which uh, literally translates GML into at least something that could be considered C++. It's not exactly human readable and then is compiled with a uh, C++ compiler. But what the plan with LLVM is, is that uh, LLVM is a, I feel like this is gonna be hard to explain and I should start over, but it's, it's intended to be generated from other languages. Uh, it's supposed to be a language independent uh, machine code. And you can, oh boy, I'm tempted to just bring up the Wikipedia page for this, but you can take it. <laughs> The, uh, the idea is that you can take any language, any high-level language, GML or probably, I'm sure JavaScript or Lua or those sorts of languages also have uh, interpreters and can be compiled to a native executable using LLVM uh, without having to do things like uh, first convert it to C++, which is the source of most yo-yo compiler errors and then, and then compiling the C++. And the end goal is that uh, there, there won't be two modes of execution for Game Maker games. They'll just be the, the regular LLVM um, export, and it should be much faster than the Game Maker Virtual Machine. And I, uh, I guess hopefully it should break a lot less often than the Yo than the YoYo compiler version. That's that's not my perfect explanation of what it is, but I hope that it gets the picture across for uh, most people. Sure. Yeah, that's a pretty good explanation, and hopefully that means on the and if the yo-yo games team they're able to keep things up to date easier you know and it won't be so complicated fixing bugs and stuff like that like having two separate versions yeah it's not exactly uncommon to see that a bug exists in the in the yo-yo compiler version and doesn't exist in the vm or rarely right. you get the other way around where something doesn't work in vm and does work in yyc and just yeah. not having to have them maintain two separate like really two separate exports at the same time for all platforms is probably going to like cut down on the frequency at which things go wrong when they add new features. There are some really exotic ones with uh, the last couple of betas with like time sources and stuff. I don't know if you've uh, played around with those and had things, had things uh, blow up in unusual ways, but we said we wanted to get through this quickly and here I go. <laughs> so language stuff um, or language support stuff. I'm assuming you're talking about the adding different language support, uh, support for different programming languages. Um, I assume that when I wrote that down, or when whoever wrote that down on our note sheet was talking about like the the natural real world languages in like the IDE and oh right yes um, okay. like displaying text in the game and stuff. But it could go either way. That that's something I think would be really cool. Totally just me making up something, but. I think it would be cool if there was some way to like write JavaScript code or something in Game Maker. Can you imagine that? I could yeah. I could see that causing problems too. But another item it, on the uh, the Game Maker iceberg meme chart was that back in two point two, you actually could. I don't believe it worked very well. Wow, I didn't know about that. In the um yeah in the the project file there is a. Like if you opened up the YYP project file in a text editor, there was a mostly like innocuous um, property that was like use ECMA or something like that. And if you turn that on, you could sort of use JavaScript, but that's long gone. Um, mm. And I don't know if it really worked very well. Mm. Yeah, I can't imagine how you would integrate that with like the regular GML stuff and not have like conflicts and, and interesting problems there, but. It's a cool concept. I'd be a big fan if they allowed that. Um, I mean, or... and then that would just be one more thing that would, you know, some people complain about Game Maker as being, um, it feeling like, I don't know, too easy and too basic or something. But if you have something that's like a, a very established programming language that you can use as well as GML, then that would be something where, um, that would probably bring in more people. Um, they'd be interested in basically, you know, using a a uh, programming language that you can kind of branch out and you can use elsewhere as well. 
even uh, even without the like the game maker isn't a real language meme. There's just if someone is already familiar with another language and they want to use it, it would be nice if they just could do that. That would be cool. Um, even like to this day, and this isn't something that was secret and was removed. But if you go into the game maker preferences, there is a section for languages, and currently the only thing under it is GML. So I feel like the idea of this has been kicking around for a long time now. Probably, yeah. Uh, something that was came up to on this topic was having automatic glue code. So somehow they're gonna like try to automatically glue different languages together, and I don't know what that means exactly. I so think that means yeah. Was that um was that mentioned in reference to like the updated interface to DLL extensions and that sort of thing? I think so, but this is where like I'm not sure how far it extends. Like what what? Yeah, it's kind of too much for me. The extension system for like Windows binary DLLs is still kind of something out of like 2006. Like you have a limited number of arguments; they can only be two types. If you have more than four arguments, they have to be, they have to all be reals. And they said they were expanding the extension mechanism to include like both dynamic libraries and static libraries, which honestly, I'm not actually sure what the difference is, but yeah. I think the, when they were talking about the glue languages, they were talking about the interface between that, all those things between game maker and other uh, binaries. At the least with whatever they're doing, it does seem like this, I'm excited for it, and it could allow the more professional, advanced users to have more freedom, the more stuff to just do some really cool things mm -hmm. in performance where they need it. You can do so, some really um, cool things with extensions. It's just kind of a pain to do because the yeah. Game Maker extension interface is what it is. And also, people have a thing for not like writing all of their code on their own, which is a different matter. But but I say it's already been pretty easy with like Game Maker. Whenever I've had to like for the HTML5 platform build like a JavaScript. Uh, extension it's actually been really really easy and those two have tied easily together for me like johnny mentioned javascript that was cool to have an option i've actually liked javascript largely mm -hmm. coming between that and game maker um if that was made even better and more more interpolation between those two yeah that, that would just be cool that would be awesome yeah yeah does anybody know about uh permanent license uh end of life my this assumption yeah, I don't think they've said anything concrete, but they've been very careful about the languages that they that Yo-Yo Games has used whenever anyone asks. And mm -hmm. my, this is probably going to piss a lot of people off, but my assumption is that it, when the new runtime comes out, that's going to be the end of the like old licenses. Um, before okay. anyone gets up in arms, the uh, the current date on the roadmap, and I think in the uh, in the presentation was that new runtime goes into beta next year, and mm -hmm. given how Yo-Yo Games has been about meeting their deadlines with things in the past. I wouldn't be surprised if it takes even longer than that. Right. Yeah. So, and that's only when it hits beta. Who knows how long it's going to take until it hits stable? Because uh, 2.3 was in private beta for like four months, and then in public beta for like four months, and then I'm sure that this is going to take just as long, if not longer. For sure. There's so many different changes and stuff. I I would be surprised if they could kick it out that fast because that's. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of work. <laughs> I do know that it's been in the works for a while. I probably shouldn't like name who informed me that this was originally happening back several years ago, but um, this isn't something that they just started doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I took a look at the roadmap, and it does show, you know, there's a lot of things that are in pre-production pre or haven't even been started yet, mm -hmm. but um, it shows for the the new runtime, uh, that's something that's currently pending. So yeah. there is definitely development going on there. Yeah, if the roadmap is anything to judge by, the new runtime is not yet like the primary focus. Right, it's because at every the bottom. Everything but, that yeah. is in active production is still like the new stuff. Um, to right. anyone who's been asking about like when is Game Maker 3 coming out, this is functionally Game Maker 3. It's just the naming system yeah. has changed. So it's just the versioning has changed. All of us with uh, anyone with uh, permanent licenses should expect to be on the subscription the subscription model at that point. I, yeah. I'm not even, I'm not planning to be mad at all. Cause it's like, you know what? Yeah, this is tons of new stuff. This was, this was a big thing that people were upset about when the licensing change first happened. But I, I said it then and I'll say it now. I bought Game Maker Studio 2 for $60 when it was on sale in 2016, last 17. I think I've gotten my money's worth. Yeah, right. I, 
And they've given me six years of free updates, so I can't really expect that to... Right. That, yeah. When I did the math about like ha- the different um, modules that I bought, and you know, I bought Game Maker One, then Game Maker Two, and I for Game Maker One I bought multiple different platform exports. For Game Maker Two, I bought multiple different versions, like the mobile and the web and things like that. And when I averaged it out, I think it ended up being roughly a hundred dollars a year, which is what I'm paying uh, with a subscription right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I think, you know, when, when you think about it that way, that doesn't seem that bad. It's like the same rate that we're getting. But the difference is everybody gets the, um, they get all the different exports. N- not all of them, but, you know, the, you get the um, web exports and the desktop stuff. And you, you get a decent selection of exports. Everybody gets that. And then, of course, there is a cheaper version that came out a little bit later. I think it's like $50 a year where you get just Windows or, or just desktop exports. Can anyone confirm that? Um, I think it's just Windows, but let me check real quick because that would be an embarrassing thing to get wrong. <laughs> so I thought that all of the desktop platforms were kind of put together. Okay, yeah, the, uh, the creator license, which is $50 a year, is uh, uh, OGX and, and also desktop. Okay. Desktop is a collective, not just Windows. Yeah. So that that's pretty cool. Like, you know, if you want to spend only fifty dollars a year, um, it's still, I don't think it's too bad of an investment. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that I was concerned about when they first talked about the subscription model was, you know, it's a little bit harder for like kids who are trying to get into game development. It's harder to justify that kind of like regular commitment. Um, but on the other hand, it also kind of incentivizes people to actually finish games and, and make progress and make releases and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't know. It seems but kind of, the like kids, that's where the GXC comes in. And then, yeah, yeah. No yeah that's the other cool thing. Like the, the trial has no time limit and no limit to resources anymore. Yeah. So I really can't complain that much. Like, you know, anybody can get in and start making games and even get the games out there for their friends to play without even paying anything. So it's really hard to complain about that. Yeah, and that's what I was going to bring up is that like the free version of Game Maker is better than it's been in a really long time now. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Like not since the days of of when Game Maker was maintained by like one person. Right. If there was a time limit still, like you could only try it for 30 days. I don't know if I would be able to learn game maker and really get into it if with that kind of limitation like when i started i really took my time with it and i just had fun and it took me a while to play around and get to the point where i'm like okay i want to buy this thing and and not be limited by the resources or anything like that Mm -hmm. so uh, i don't know if that's you guys but that's how my experience was for the longest time the thing that made it hardest for me to recommend game maker to people was that the free trial was so bad right yeah yeah, it's really hard. It was really hard to get into it, and I, I'd say now you could really get the full game maker experience. So, I mean, yeah, that's cool. Just quick, how, how many how many twelve year old kids are downloading Opera GX browser just because of Game Maker? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, be <laughs> I'd be fascinated if you, if uh, Opera has any data on that. Although, I'm, if they did, I'm not sure. Well, I'm sure <laughs> they do, but I'm not sure if they would share it with us. Hmm. But how, yeah, yeah, that's the thing that was really important to me when I started was being able to create a game and sending it to my friends and things like that. And back in those days, you had a limit to the number of objects and, and I think all of the resources had some sort of limit. And then um, there was a watermark. So every time you load the game, it would say game maker or whatever. Back um, in the 8.x but, days when I started, they didn't have the resource limit, but everything did have that big, huge hunk and watermark on it that was kind of, like, awkward. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you also record gameplay and have, like, bandy cam like, <laughs> on, on top of your gameplay? Some of my old YouTube videos, it wasn't bandy cam, but it was pretty much like that. Um, <laughs> like, I, I forget the, what the I used to location. record my screen back in the days before OBS. There were a couple things, and none of them were very good. Yeah, I encourage people to not look at my old YouTube videos that are still up there because they're just horrible quality. 
Well, I but... guess I know what I'm doing after we get off this call. <laughs> <laughs> Back when I was using a laptop, um, just like there was no graphics card or anything, and I was still doing like shader stuff, but it was just awful quality and horrible resolution. But it was fun, and it was a great learning experience. I learned a lot about optimization that way. Right, because you have to. I did mm-hmm. camcorder vision for most of my YouTube videos until like 2014. <laughs> nice. Beautiful. All right, what's up next? Uh, someone wrote down on the note sheet, is the slow death of UWP of concern? Is that, is that a yes or a no? no. Uh, it doesn't concern me because I haven't used it. So I, I don't care, but do you guys care? I, I can't say I know anyone who's ever actually used UWP for reasons other than just like making jokes about it. Yeah. Um, I'd be surprised if a majority of users even realized that it was there. Right. I mean, I, I was considering it. Um, I think back in the day it was like part of the Xbox export, but I don't know if that's even true anymore. And in any case, Xbox is being end of life anyway, and there is a procedure for dealing with that. Yeah, I had yeah. I'd been considering using UWP like it was an option on the radar. I never did get to it. Um, this does seem normal for Microsoft because they had like XNA back in the day. And then I guess then they're now UDP and now they're going to GDK. It just, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't even know how they all relate or not relate. But uh, as far as Microsoft goes and their APIs, it doesn't seem unusual, maybe. But anyway, it doesn't really affect me either. But I'm sure it does affect some people. And some people in the forums have been mentioning how they actually do use it. So it does concern them. But it just doesn't seem like a majority of an issue for most people. If anything, I kind of feel like it's just like yet more technical debt for something that will benefit only a few people and also causes a lot of problems. But actually, maybe if I actually used it, I would think differently. Who knows? Yeah. Is it finally time to talk about the graphics stuff? Yes. This is the, uh, the, the, reason, that I, the reason that I sent uh, John a message asking if he wanted yeah. to scream. Which I, I'm so disappointed we weren't able to get to it last time. But, you know, we're, we're covering it now. And we should have enough time to hopefully go through everything. So... If this is what we spend the rest of the video on, I won't be disappointed. Yeah, yeah. that would be fine with me. Um, one of the first things that they had mentioned was compute shaders, which um, which are going to be really interesting because they're a more general type of shader. So you have the fragment shader and the vertex shader. Vertex shader runs on every single vertex, as the name implies. And that means you can use it to, like... Uh, move meshes around so it can be used for like animation shaders i used it for an ocean shader that i made where um i had a flat plane and then i just had each vertex move up and down and side to side to like look like water basically so that's a vertex shader fragment shader most people understand that um if you know anything about shaders that's what most people use it's a shader that is run on every single pixel um and there's a lot of things you can do with that. You can sample textures, you can distort textures, and, and you change colors and things like that. And in my case, I like to do a lot of like ray tracing stuff and fancy 3D stuff. But then there's a new type that we're eventually going to have access to, probably um, later 2023, or, or maybe even later than that. But anyway, um, compute shaders. Compute shaders, um, I haven't written one personally, I'm, so I'm looking forward to that, but that's something I need to specify because um, that may change my perspective once I actually get to using them. Um, but they're really good for particles, uh, fluid simulation, physics simulation, erosion, basically anything that would require um, parallel computing. So a bit like a fragment shader, but you can use it on different types of data you can use it it's not just about pixels and it's not just visual you can use it on buffers itself and so that's where it becomes really useful is you know like moving particles you can change the positions of particles and and things like that not just like rgb pixels you get into any sort of data can be modified with compute shaders um i'm curious if anybody has any questions about that or if anything they want to add not really. Uh, compute shaders are just like general purpose things that you'd want to do massively in parallel. If you're into writing, I believe, um, like AI, um, 
you, leveraging a graphics card to do uh, computations, I believe that would be a, a use for compute shaders. Uh, maybe not in Game Maker, but just if you're looking for an example of what they are. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned particles, you mentioned uh, fluid simulations, uh, physics simulations, things like that. Things that you would want to, that you have a lot of data that is relatively simple to process, but there's just so much of it that it's impractical to do on the CPU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the cool thing is you don't have to rely on anything being sequential. Um, like with the, with the CPU, everything is calculated in a certain order. Obviously, you have multiple threads, so... I mean, not in Game Maker yet, but you have multiple threads, so that can change things a little bit. Um, but with the, with the GPU, everything can be calculated at the same time. It's just a big calculation machine that just processes a bunch of small pieces of data at the same time. And compute shaders are especially interesting because you can... Um, Instead of just like writing data, you, you can read, well, instead of just reading data, you can write data. So kind of like how in a fragment shader, you're able to sample a texture and that's reading the texture basically. Um, but with a compute shader, you can also write to the texture. And that's where it gets like really crazy and mind blowing because you can write things. Uh, and then the order is important because if you write things first, then you can read it back and you'll read the new written data. Um, so I, I don't fully understand how all that's going to work, but I'm looking forward to playing around with that and just seeing what kind of stuff is possible. I know there's potential with like ray tracing stuff. In the fragment shader, you do write to a texture because that's what GL underscore frag color is, but it's yeah. very, it's very like restricted and you can, you can do a little bit with it if you're creative, but there's like, it's very restricted. The thing that yeah, the thing that's really interesting about the compute shader is that you can write to a different pixel. Yeah. Um, basically, so with the fragment shader, you're just going one pixel at a time, and you're writing that particular pixel. But for example, you could read something and decide to write that data to a totally random pixel, and and so you might write to the same pixel multiple times. I'm saying pixel because it, I'm imagining it as like a visual buffer, but it can be any type of buffer. We're going to um, get so to that in a, in a few minutes general. too, because they did talk yeah, about that sure. as well. So yeah, compute shaders are cool. Lots of simulation stuff. Um, the next thing on my list I want to talk about was uh, updated shader languages. So they didn't specify exactly what that means, but I'm assuming it means they're going to update uh, GLSL ES, which is what I care about the most, because that's the shader language that you use across all the platforms. Um, once they update that, there's a ton of different things that come along with it. Um, and I'm, I'm going to kind of infer some things it, none of this, none of these things are official, but I'm just assuming this is how it's going to work. So we should hopefully have access to, uh, vertex texture fetching, which means in the vertex shader, you can actually read textures right now. You can't do that. That's not possible in game maker. Um, except for maybe an HTML5 platform or something weird like that. But you'll finally be able to do it on all platforms. And that's super cool because that, you know, an example would be you could read a height map surface um, and then move vertices up and down based off of a height map. So you can have like a 3D, I, I think of water because I wrote a water shader. So you'd have a 3D water shader where the water... Uh, goes up and down, but it's completely reactive to anything on the surface. So you can draw um, objects to the surface and have ripples come off from the objects. It's all completely dynamic, and um, everything everything can be controlled in real time. So that's going to be interesting. There's there's a lot more things that can be done with that. You can use it for particle systems again. There. Um, Another thing is multiple render targets. Right now, the support is a little bit shaky across plat on different platforms and stuff, but I think we talked about this a little bit in the last video. Basically, you'll be able to, instead of just having the fragment shader output one color at, for each pixel, you can have it output up to four colors to four different surfaces. And so that means you can write shaders that are extremely efficient for lighting systems and things like that. You can 
output the diffuse color to one surface, normal map to another, depth map to another, things like that. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what kind of systems people make with that. I'm trying to wrap my head around what that all means. <laughs> like, I, it yeah, sounds very awesome. useful. But yeah, if, if anybody has any questions, yeah, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and ask. Let me take a drink real quick. Yeah, yeah. And if anybody has comments, uh, leave comments for uh, XOR. He can he can answer all your questions on chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll I'll read through the comments and I'll see if anybody has any questions about anything. Well, I'm kind of cool. over it pretty fast because there's a lot to cover. But I I was just like wanting to, for one game I'm working on is considering. Okay, do I actually want to fill this level with water and have it like the water change based upon where the character's at? What's that going to yeah. take? And I was thinking, okay, now with my knowledge, I have to like actually affect uh, uh, change the vertices and the model itself. Mm -hmm. and kind of do mm -hmm. that. Um, how much more efficient is it to handle that on the GPU? Um, extremely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't give an exact number because it depends on like the number of vertices and things like that. But yeah, it would be, uh, I don't think it would be feasible to do that on the CPU. Um, because again, you're just running the, uh, it's a simple program, but you're running it on maybe a million vertices. You know, it could be an insane amount and, and it's just not really possible. But with a shader, you could do completely dynamic water all at once at the same time. And, and it's just cool because you can use textures to do that. And so there's just so many possibilities with textures in the vertex shader. And, um, I'm looking forward to being able to actually have access to that because I haven't had that yet. Um, but, you know, it, that's something that once that's a possibility, it will probably bring out more ideas too. The water thing is the first thing I can think of or any sort of like dynamic height map where you read a height map texture and you use that for the vert vertex height. Um, but there's so many possibilities that can be done there. Would that also possibly allow you to say, like, say you had like rain or snow, and then you would run that all GPU particles and have it collide with a, a mesh? Yeah, yeah. You could you could have something where um, maybe you have like an amount of snow on the ground, and so it pushes the vertices up, like as you as snow piles up, right. and then that this is more for like a three D thing, of course. Um, and then you could have it so there's like footsteps. You know, you're walking through the snow, and you push, you flatten the snow back down. And that would look really cool. You could do this totally. in Game Maker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could totally do that. I look forward in three years to the number of people who are who are going to inevitably inevitably saying, wait a minute, you mean this is this isn't like a UE4 project or whatever, or at least a Unity yeah, project? Right. So that still happens once in a while that people have that reaction to something that like Snyder does, but uh, it's probably gonna happen a lot more in the future. Right. There are some ways I kind of try to get around this stuff. So one of the things that I'll do is I'll do all the ray casting in a fragment shader. So you can write your own height map shader and then have it read a texture and stuff like that. But usually ray tracing systems are actually slower than the vertex shader would be. Um, so having a way to do this in a cleaner format would be nice. Yep. Um, and that's what I'm really excited about. Okay, uh, texture formats. So right now, when you create a surface, uh, my understanding is that the surface is always 32 bits. Um, I'm curious if anyone would have any knowledge that points to anything else, because maybe if you're using like a 10-bit monitor, it would be different, 10-bit color. Currently, we only have 32-bit uh, RGBA. Uh, some people okay. in particular, uh, Jan Vorsek and the 3D channel in the main Discord, are constantly uh, lamenting that fact and wishing that, there were other right, formats. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, yeah, I'll write, like, a um, 3D lighting shader that, you know, casts shadows and stuff. And to do that, typically, you need a depth map, um, which I think, Dragonite, you have some videos on that, don't you? Yeah, and it's it's a lot of math, and it would just be so much easier if we just had a 32-bit yes. yeah. Um, yeah. So, floating point yeah, right texture. Now, right now, yeah, to do the, de the um, depth thing, you, if you used only one channel, you'd have 0 to 255 um, different values that you could use. It would be only 8-bit per channel. Um, and then people use, that's not enough precision usually for a depth map. And so what people will do is they'll use the red channel for 
uh, one set of precision, green channel for another, blue channel, and they use all the different channels to pack more data in, but it's a complicated process. It's more expensive and it's confusing to learn. It's even confusing to explain. It's also less precise because when the uh, the color actually goes into the texture, it's it's rounded to a two to eight bits. Mm, so you yeah. do you, you, you still lose precision even if you do that. Yeah, but now what we should have is we should have a surface that you can create that would um, be able to have thirty two bits in a single channel, and so you could just have a depth map channel. You only need the depth value, so you, that's all you need, and you can have 32-bit values. And it has some extra perks, uh, because then you can actually do texture interpolation. Again, this probably doesn't matter to most people, but it's something that I'm excited about. So if you have a, a, a depth map for like shadow mapping, um, right now if you try to interpolate it when you're doing all the RGB blending fanciness, uh, you get artifacts everywhere. Mm. But if you have a single 32-bit uh, surface, then you're able to use interpolation like you normally would. Um, that's going to be cool. Another thing I'm thinking about, which hasn't been mentioned anywhere, and this is my own, uh, my own hope, I guess. I don't know for sure if this is going to happen, but I'm really hoping they add cube maps and 3D volume textures. If they add cube maps then you can do um, uh, you can do like environment mapping, you can do all sorts of lighting things. You can do like uh, 3D point lights with shadows a lot easier and reflections and stuff like that. There are ways to do it now, but they're a little bit janky. They're, they're not the best way. Um, so to have a way to do it would be awesome. Can you correct me if I'm wrong, but are Q maps for reflections like a, a, a poor man's ray tracing? Um, yes, basically, yeah. So a cube map is just a texture that, um, it's like a spherical texture. So instead of it just being a 2D texture, it's a texture that has, well, I guess a cubic texture. It's a, a texture that has six different faces to it. And so if you're facing one direction, it uses one side of that cube map. Facing another direction, it uses another. And so it m builds a complete mesh. So it can be used for like sky boxes. But yeah, it's mainly used for like reflections and lighting systems and things like that. Right. So having a way to do that, if you could have a texture that's a cube map, that would be cool for any sort of 3D projects. I know that's not for everybody, but if anybody's interested in 3D stuff, this would be amazing. And then you could also do it with surfaces. You, you could have uh, cube map surfaces, which would be pretty cool. You could have like any shader run on a cube map. I feel like we're talking about multiple dimensions at this point. <laughs> yeah, we're I mean, yeah. <laughs> Most of this stuff really excites me because it has to do with 3D stuff. Um, well, it can be used for 3D stuff. So even if most people don't use it this way, I'm going to. I just know I will. And I'm well, super pumped about it. And that's what's cool. The people that do know what to do with it, they can go ahead with it and do it and show off what Game Maker yeah, can do. Yeah, it's really, it looks good for Game Maker. And yeah. then also, um, it's it's the technology that is behind most other 3D game engines out there. So really, once you have access to these things, you can do a lot more of the stuff that other engines already do. You can just do it. Right now, it's not technically possible in some ways. You can do a lot of stuff with Game Maker, a lot more than people realize. But there are certain technical limitations that are really hard to get around. And so having an actual system in place to allow you to do these things, even if you don't, having that possibility would be amazing. And I know a bunch of 3D people that would use this stuff. Like this knitter, um, uh, uh, his name evades me right now, but I'm, I'm thinking of, what's that? Patrick Crafe. Yes, yeah. Uh, funnily yeah. enough, uh, he recently got hired by Yo-Yo Games, and I strongly suspect that he is behind a lot of this, or at least that he will be working on a lot of this. So Yes, that would be awesome. And hopefully he kind of nudges in the 3D direction, because I know he knows a lot about the 3D stuff, and he's made his own 3D editor, um, and he's done like some PBR shaders and things like that. So it would be cool if he kind of pushes in that direction. 
I think even, I'm sure there's going to be more than just him working on this, but just knowing that he's on the team gives me a lot of faith that this is probably going to go pretty well and it's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm I'm happy that Game Maker is involving the community. Like, he's a guy that we respect, that the community respects, and to see that they're investing in people like that is really promising for the future. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see more stuff like that. It was really hard to resist just jumping in all over the place in there because they have a few examples of, uh, of things that you can do with this. Uh, first, I did not hear this mentioned, and I was a little disappointed that it wasn't, although it's probably not impossible that it'll uh, make its uh, appearance at some point, but geometry shaders I was hoping for. Mm. For those who are unaware of geometry shaders, there's a couple different shader types besides vertex and fragment. We've already talked about compute. Uh, geometry shaders essentially let you spawn geometry on the fly on the GPU instead of having to submit it as a vertex buffer. Definitely could think of some applications there, but uh, that remains to be seen, and there's plenty of other stuff to keep me excited until um, perhaps someone makes the case for that to be added to Game Maker for real. Yeah, that would be another thing that would be super useful for particles. So you could have mm -hmm. like a compute shader that calculates the vertices of uh, 3D particles, and then the geometry shader will turn those particles into 3D meshes or 2D like billboarded meshes or, you know, there's all sorts of things that those two would go hand in hand really well. Yeah, so if the geom if the compute shader just uh, computed the positions of each particle, the geometry shader would actually like turn that into something visual. Right, yeah. I'm happy with compute shaders. I think compute shaders are probably more important than geometry shaders. If they can add something like that, that would be really cool, but I don't see much use in that in 2D scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, com compute shaders actually still can be useful in 2D uh, effects, but I don't think you'd use that very much for 3D, or you wouldn't use geometry shaders as much. Probably. Um, if you're doing 3D stuff. Compute shaders are, again, just general purpose, like parallel processing math machines. Uh, geometry shaders are mostly used in most games for things like spawning geometry until your GPU is begging you to stop. Mm -hmm. um, which is something that I'm interested in and probably like five, five other people in the entire Game Maker user base, so. Yeah, I mean, I certainly would find that cool, but um, I'm, I'm more than happy enough with the other stuff here that that's enough to get me started with a lot more different effects and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, my stance for the longest time has been that as much as I would like it, I actually kind of didn't want Game Maker to do 3D stuff because I wanted them to focus on things that more people would actually use. Yeah. That's the thing that's cool, though, is they're not really, like, well, at least not yet, they're not doing any, like, 3D stuff, strictly 3D. They're just updating the shader stuff and updating the formats, all things that they should do anyway. And then it has applications in 3D scenarios, which people like me are going to use. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. pretty much. Well, I want to inject with what, I mean, it's a little bit of a side tangent, but uh, speculation, do you think the new particle runtime, because there's mention of the new particle system and the runtime supporting delta timing, but not until the new runtime. Um, but I'm wondering if that's going to be run on, on um, compute shaders and that as well. I wonder if they're going to move it away from the CPU to the GPU for the, um, the built-in particle system. But that's speculation. Not totally sure. Yeah, I, I have no idea if they would do that, but I, I certainly think that would be cool and that would be a good application for compute shaders. Yeah. I don't have any knowledge on that, but that would be cool. They certainly could do it. I kind of don't expect them to because the particle system that Game Maker already has is already very capable. And what I'm imagining they're going to do with regards to delta time is just like multiply the velocities and uh, right. angular velocities of everything by just a fixed time step. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think they have plans to like completely revamp the particle system. There's a couple of things that people wish the particle system would be able to do, like interact with things physically. Um, it used to have like attractors and deflectors in old versions of Game Maker, but those Apparently days are behind us. are coming back. Are they? Yeah, uh, um, <clears throat> I think, um, what's his name on the forum from the, uh, from the actual Game Maker team? So uh, Primo? Someone asked about attractors. Yeah. Oh, really? I missed that, that one. Attractors are for the new runtime. That's cool. I feel like they're going to keep the particle system that they have now and just like add stuff to it because it, it's pretty fundamentally useful uh, instead of just rewriting the whole thing to use compute shaders but I've uh, I've been surprised at the, the the lengths that they've gone to change things recently so who knows 
Uh, let's see, what else was there that uh, that came to mind when Exor was explaining the, the whole thing? Um, deferred rendering is, I believe you mentioned that, probably something that's going to get a lot easier if you're interested in 3D. Uh, right now you can do it. It's a little bit, a little bit messy for the reasons that you did that you did go over. If you're trying to write a deferred render right now, the typical way that you have to do it if you're aiming for multiple platforms, you have to have an HLSL deferred rendering shader, which basically uh, runs a shader multiple times and uh, it outputs the diffuse color, normal maps, depth information, anything like that onto separate surfaces. So you have to use HLSL to do that on Windows. Um, and then you have to use GLSL on Mac or Linux. Um, and so it's just annoying because you have to use like two or three different languages for multiple different platforms. But if you can do that in GLSL ES, then you just write one shader and you can use it everywhere. So that will help with like compatibility and making the process a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other... Uh, an example that I have that would make use of a number of the items on this list is I have a thing for writing terrain editors in Game Maker, like things that you can click on terrain and create mountains and stuff. And that would benefit from these things in a number of departments. So things like a vertex, te vertex texture, this is really hard to say, vertex texture fetching, a vertex texture sampling. Um, you could use that to literally just create a height map. Uh, right now, what I have to do for that is um, deform the, the vertex buffer on the fly, which is expensive and I use a lot of annoying hacks to get it to work at 60 frames per second, but it's still uh, not super efficient. That's off the CPU that you're getting the inefficiency or the GPU? Uh, CPU, since you have to do to act on the vertex buffer on the CPU side. Right. That's something that could also uh, be affected by the, uh, the language updates, like uh, the DLL stuff that we talked about a little while ago, because that's where it's done, because that's faster than in GML. But things like deforming the terrain in interesting ways using compute shaders. I believe John already mentioned things like erosion simulations and, uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, one thing I was thinking about in, along the lines of the cube maps, um, if we have cube maps, this might be a, a stretch a little bit further, but we might get access to 3D volume textures, which... Again, that's probably not something most people would use, but I'm super excited about it. You could you could technically use it for like 2D animations where the third dimension is time, but whatever. That's not something most people are going to use it for. You're blowing my mind. I, I'm excited about 3D volume textures because that can be used um, for like you could have a noise texture, um, which would be uh, useful for texturing. 3D objects and stuff, you could texture it a lot easier. Another option is ray tracing. If you have a 3D volume texture, you could actually use that as a voxel map. You could have voxels stored in a texture, and it would be incredibly efficient. It would render really fast. I'm actually doing this uh, hacky way right now where I'm using a 2D texture. But to do that, I basically have to have each layer next to the last one on the surface. So it's like a, um, I think it was one, 128 by 128 by 128 volume that I'm trying to do. And so in order to do that, I have to have the X, the, like the width of the surface to be 128 times 128. And then the height is just 128. So it's like a really long surface. And then I just split up each uh, 128 pixel uh, section into a separate Z layer. So it's a complicated process. And then if you want to interpolate between the different layers, that requires an extra texture sample. And it's slow, it's messy, it's not very fun, but it looks cool. Yeah, so if we could not... actually have... Sorry, what's that? So it's probably not fun if you don't find it fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I skipped over that part. Like, I, once I got that going, I haven't had to touch it since, which is nice. But... Um, you know, that part was kind of frustrating to get working and it still has some problems because I, you can't easily have a, a um, tiling texture when it's a 3D texture, but it's actually just 2D textures next to each other. If you interpolate, you're interpolating into the next Z layer and that creates artifacts. So you can actually see that in like my 
uh, 3D ray tracing systems that I'm making. But um, if you have 3D volume textures, that means you could do ray tracing stuff really cool. You could do uh, voxel stuff and make it efficient. I want to do like voxel ox trees and fluid simulations and things like that. And you could use 3D textures for all of that. Um, and then you could even use that for like particle stuff or 3D clouds, you know, 3D, basically 3D anything. 3D um, clouds was the example I was oh, thinking yeah. of for 3D textures. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and, and you can use it for any sort of like volumetric effect, like a three D fire, you know, smoke, things like that. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I'm excited about that. I know that's probably not for everybody, but if they happen to add that, I'm going to use it, and I'm going to make some really cool stuff with it. I have plans. I promised at the beginning of this video that this was going to mostly be the weird nerd stuff. <laughs> yes, I think we delivered so far. Um, so we have a limit, limited amount of time before you got to run. Uh, is there anything else yes. you want to hit real quick? Yeah, I'm just going to try to wrap up the last couple things. There's a something about buffer formats. I'm not too sure. Uh, I haven't heard much about that. Uh, have you guys heard anything about buffer formats? Oh, I think they. Um, I think I do know what this is. Uh, index buffers, index buff vertex buffers, was mentioned in the in the video presentation. Okay, that'd be interesting. That is, if you think of uh, for the uh, the uninformed, instead of having each vertex for a vertex buffer laid out in sequence, if you just have like a palette, for lack of better terms, of things like three D positions and texture coordinates. Um, stored at the beginning, and then each vertex is just a pointer to a 3D position and a texture coordinate and a normal and stuff like that. Uh, you could potentially save, like, have the same amount of geometry but take up a lot less space. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, if you've ever opened up an Awayfront OBJ file and looked at the way that the vertices are laid out, uh, so you have uh, the uh, the vertex positions at the beginning, and then later on you have uh, faces which are just uh, collections of pointers back to positions in the list of vertices. Yeah, I was going to actually mention that. I was curious if that was kind of like how OBJ file formats work. Um, but yeah, that that should make a lot of like 3D model rendering or 2D model rendering more efficient. And then another small thing most people are not going to care about, but um, we should have ac access to uh, MIP maps for surfaces, I'm really hoping. Right now, you can do MIP mapping, and that's useful for a few effects. But the problem is you can't use it on surfaces. Um, MIP mapping is useful for just like cheaply blurring, doing blur effects, doing bloom effects, things like that, where you just sample a lower resolution version of the texture. Um, but you can't do that on... Uh, on surfaces at all, and that really limits what you can do with it because you can't use it for any like post processing effects. You can only do it for static sprites that you've already pre generated. So you can't so apply that, mid mapping to a new sprite at runtime? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you might be able, I'm not sure. There, I think there might be a setting where you can have it generate a mid map when it loads, but you know, it's not ideal. What would be really cool is if there's a way you can generate that during runtime, which I'm suspecting there will be if they update this. And then there's a few other functions that come along with it. There's a uh, texture gradient thing, which gets a lot more technical than I want to go today. But um, it's cool, it's useful, and it'll make games look better. So I'm happy with that. Mid mapping, the short version, uh, the short explanation is that imagine having one texture that has multiple uh, resolutions built in. Right, yeah. Yeah, you can sample between them, and you can. So, if you need a very blurry, low resolution version, you can do that. And that just makes things look smoother, transitions. Like Minecraft uses that for blocks that are really far away, they use a lower resolution texture. A lot of games use them for low level things with low levels of detail, so like objects way off in the distance, so that you don't have to, um, like, you, you don't have to sample from the full resolution texture for something that's only going to be a few pixels on the screen. Um, I yeah. believe it's more performant, and also usually it looks better because you get fewer like weird um, moray artifacts when you do that. For sure. 
And also there, there's other artistic things that you could do with it, like bloom and that sort of effect. Mm -hmm. I've noticed for shaders where I use it, it actually is a lot faster if mm -hmm. you use uh, mip mapping. And then oftentimes it looks better, you know, rather than, you, you can get a lot of artifacts from using a texture that is way too high resolution for the current scene. So if you can actually downsample, you can you can uh, downscale it and then sample it, it will look smoother and you won't see as many artifacts. So I'm really hoping we can see more stuff like that. Let's see, is there anything else with regards to graphics? I think we hit everything on the list. Yeah, that's that's all I wanted to cover anyway. We have time for one more topic. Are you gonna are you gonna go for the multi threading, Steven? Oh, can we just can we just quickly please? <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. We got like five or ten minutes. So, all right. Yeah. So this is excites me. I, I found just I just noticed it today that I am Primo it, um, mentioned on the forum. Someone asked about multi thread support and they said like full full access to multi thread, no. But um, they're looking at like this task worker interface kind of thing where you can offload tasks to be threaded, but it's not like a full blown multi threading. But nonetheless, this excites me because I would like to really experiment with between compute shaders and this, Game Maker could be a lot more um, performant. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing. Like, you know, CPU, like GPUs are designed to be completely parallel where you run, you know, thousands of programs at the same time. Uh, yeah. But CPUs are increasingly getting more threads. And you can actually do a few things simultaneously, but with Game Maker, I think you're only locked in one thread at a time. So having access to a system where you can actually compute some things on one thread, some things on another thread, then you're not held up on one particular thread getting bogged down for whatever reason. And then I actually think it's cooler personally that they um, are not doing a full multi-threading thing but just giving you a worker task system because um for most people that's that's probably easier it's more accessible and you don't really need to get down to the nitty-gritty details of it like for me personally i don't really care about doing all the fancy multi-threaded stuff i just want it to be you know easy enough to, to get it going so i think that's cool the joke that I keep telling and people keep laughing at for some reason is a programmer has a problem, they decide to solve it using threads, now have two problems they. Um, <laughs> I think there's a, there's a couple things that people ask for that they don't realize how much, like how many, let me try that again. There's a couple things that people like to ask for that I think often they don't realize that it, they would just cause more problems than they would solve. And full access to multi-threading is, is one of them. But perhaps getting the ability to like do a limited amount of work in the background. Like if you have a, a complicated AI that runs in the background and you want to fork that off onto another thread, let it do its thing completely independent of the rest of the game. And then um, whenever it's finished, the, the game can respond appropriately. Uh, that would probably, probably be nice. Uh, there are some things in Game Maker that are asynchronous, but those are still um, running on the main thread. Game Maker is just dealing with it in the background. No, this seems great because right now, yeah, we have been locked to one single thread for like for the most part. I know I know parts of Game Maker are thread like the audio and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but but our logic, our code has been largely single threaded. So the day they open up some multi threading, it could make Game Maker like tons more performant. Just because yeah, they have been locked down the one single thread. It's frustrating because you you can buy a brand new CPU that has lots of threads um, and not take advantage of it because you're stuck to just using one thread. So it will be nice to actually have a way to do this and actually make use of modern hardware. If anyone remembers when the Yo-Yo compiler was first added to Game Maker back in, I think, like 1.2, and that allowed certain types of tasks to be dramatically um, more performant than they had been in the past, uh, especially, like, specifically things like heavy math operations. I'm picturing a similar, like, a similar shape of improvement this time around. Uh, this wouldn't really make your game 100% faster across the board, but it would allow certain tasks to be faster. I'm just, uh, I'm just fantasizing now. The the one the one way that I I'm I want to play with it and see because um, there's a tool I work on. There's a tweening engine that I'm I'm curious to see if I can paralyze that uh, par paralyze par parallelize make it run in parallel. 
Yeah, not paralyze it. Try to, I want to see if I can take it and have um, an option for a user to like, I want to run this in parallel so it's not it's not crucial of when it happens. And if I'm able to do that, I might be able to offload like maybe up to 80% of the overhead of that system to another core. And then basically it'd be largely free as compared to having been single threaded as before. Like that excites me, um, being able to now be able to like, as a tool developer being like, I want to, I want to try to load this off into another core so it doesn't, bog up the main thread of this person's code. I want to get right. out of the way. There's a number of tools in Game Maker that uh, like would have a process run in the background, except it's not in the background. It's just happening in like the end step event out of the way and out of mind. And if they were yeah. able to be executed actually in the background, that would probably um, uh, improve performance for those particular tools a lot. Yeah, oftentimes I'll have like, I'll have like a game where um, at the beginning, it's generating a massive mesh or, you know, something, some sort of buffer or something. But it would be interesting. It, well, yeah, when I run it, the game will just hang there for like a minute or two if I really push it. So it would be interesting if that's something I could break down into multiple different tasks that could be done on different um, uh, threads. And so it can the game can run a lot faster. Are, are you different. saying we'd be able to have animated loading screens? Mm, maybe that, that's a struggle for me <laughs> that's that's another one that would be really nice because that kind of also comes back to the fact that the async events aren't really multi-threaded and then like when a buffer loads async you still have to process it in gml on the main thread anyway yeah mm. so that's that's yeah. possibly another good use that would be cool yeah or even just um god what are they called um proper coroutines with like a yield statement could do that but uh, i don't think anyone, anyone's mentioned that yet I, I still don't, don't know how those work. I've seen them in Unity, and I kind of just never really got into them. But anyway. I am interested with, uh, with like, asynchronous threaded worker task things, uh, exactly where they will draw the line. Because if you, like, full, full multi-threaded support where any, there's literally code running in parallel, and it can, like, touch any other part of the code at a time, that's where you get the a programmer has a problem. Uh, they decide to use threads jokes. But right. if they, like, limit like what variables or objects or whatever you can access when you're doing that. That's probably the biggest question. All right. Well, uh, should we wrap it up there? I guess. Uh, there's a couple other minor things that were on this list, but they're uh, the exciting stuff we covered. Yeah. Hey, but the I, one quick, quick thing with is that. health, lives, and score will no longer be part of the built-in runtime, so you can now use those words, keywords in your own stuff. So, yay. Cool. Yep. Clearly the most important thing that we talked about. <laughs> of all the things that I've said people have been asking about this for a long time that's uh, probably goes back to the very beginning of GML because not being able to use certain random nouns as variable names is just never stops being infuriating It'd be cool if you could use like speed or direction as your own variable you can yeah. in structs just not in, a, in objects in inst inst right. instances alright um all right, Should that was we... fun. I hope I can edit that into get something coherent. Yeah, hopefully that's a little bit easier to edit than the last one was. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> the uh, the last uh, recording yeah. session was like an hour 40. We're at an hour 27 now, so it's actually not that much shorter. Oh, geez. It felt a little bit shorter, I think, because I was going off on graphics for a while there. Yeah, I did, I did, hit, I did hit start recording a little bit before we actually started talking about anything oh, interesting, okay. so there might be 10 minutes at the front that I can just trim off. All right. No guarantees if I'm gonna if I'm gonna just put like a static picture on the video part, or if I'm actually gonna draw cartoons again. Yeah, no, it seems like a lot of work. Don't don't kill yourself. Mm -hmm. But it was yeah, I, I it, really but it was so much fun. Doing, I appreciate you doing all this and kind of bringing us together and stuff. That's cool. Um, I don't usually make time for stuff like this or like to host something like this, but I'm really glad that you are uh, interested in it and brought made, made it happen. So that's cool. All right. Uh, thanks. You're welcome. I don't know what I'm supposed to say to that, but <laughs> one of those is probably accurate. I, uh, I had Thank fun. You. I hope you all did too. I hope anyone who's watching this who had questions maybe had at least some of them answered. <laughs> yeah. I should probably have said this at the beginning, but uh, before we did this, I did read through a couple of the forum threads about this, and I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that I missed or a lot of stuff that's been added since I... Uh, went looking. So it's definitely not impossible and probably somewhat likely that um, there are 
questions that I had in this video that would have been answered somewhere by now. But this is a very exciting all in all, I think. I hope everyone else is as excited as I am. Yeah, lots of good stuff coming. Woo. Any closing remarks? John? Nope. On. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. But we're good. John has uh, stuff he needs to do IRL in like five minutes, and I think he's just waiting for us yeah. to, to cut him loose. All right. I will see you all later. All right. See ya. Thanks for having me. Bye for now.